Good morning to everyone who has joined us today for service using our YouTube channel at Bilston SDA Church and the Zoom service. As you join our church family, may God's richest blessings be with you this glorious Sabbath day. With the joy of God's tender mercies in our hearts, let us all sing to his honour, Him to, sorry, Him. 525, hiding in thee. Welcome, Eastern Central, and happy Sabbath. Our first hymn this morning will be found in hymn number 525, hiding in thee. taken from 1 Samuel chapter 17 verses 10 and 11. 1 Samuel 17 verses 10 and 11. And the Philistine said, I defile the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. May the Lord have his blessing and this portion of reading. 
we will we will now seek the Lord in prayer. Um, I count it a privilege to be able to kneel before the maker of heaven and earth and to make my petitions known. I would um, encourage as many as are able and are minded to to join me in taking advantage of this privilege of kneeling before the Lord. And let us speak to our, our Lord and our Savior. Heavenly Father, Lord, we humbly bow before you on the Sabbath day. Lord, we bow before you to worship you, to praise you, to glory in your most precious name. The name of Jesus is literally the sweetest name any of us could ever pronounce. Father, we praise you for your love, for your long suffering towards your people, Lord, who continually backsliding into sin. But Lord, since the beginning of time, you have done and are continually doing everything possible to ensure that we would one day get to spend eternity with you. Lord, your love is beyond our understanding, Heavenly Father. Lord, we praise you and we're so grateful that you've loved us with an everlasting love. Lord, it's you who placed the stars in the sky. It's you, Lord, who just with the power of your words brought life forms and worlds into existence, even the human body, dear Father, that all the, the most learned scholars and scientists cannot even begin to fully understand. But Lord, you made us just by lovingly creating us and molding us in your hands. Lord, we are in awe of your magnificence. We are in, in awe of your splendor. Lord, if only we would have a clearer view of you, surely, Father, we would not live the lives that we are living right now. Lord, we are bound before you at this time, recognizing our need of you. We are sinners in a sinful world. And Lord, there's times where even when we think we are doing right, we are still doing wrong because we know no better. Have mercy on us, Father, have mercy. And Lord, when you've had mercy and cleansed us with the blood of Christ, I pray, Lord, that you will give us power by the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. Lord, you said that you will place your law in our hearts, in our inward parts. Father, help us to heed your law because we love you. Help us to have the strength, help us to have the spiritual inclination to know right from wrong, and then the strength, Lord, and the power to, to choose right time and time again. Father, we look for the day where there will be no sin to distract us and tempt us, but in, until that day, Heavenly Father, please keep us from temptation. Keep us close to you. Lord, we are in need of so many things. You know that we have physical needs, Lord, that which are... At times, we are struggling to meet some people on this call who are having difficulties with their work, difficulties with their financial situations, difficulties in their homes with their children, with their marriages, difficulties in their physical bodies, Lord, with the pain and the illnesses. Lord, we just present all of our needs before you, knowing that you are, you are able. You are able. Lord, you told us to, to come to you and you would give us rest. And so, Father, we lay our cares upon you, asking that you would provide for our every need, as you've always done, that you would provide for our financial needs, Lord, that you would give us love in our homes, that you would give us the, the spiritual inclination to know how we should walk and how we should follow you. Lord, may we have the peace which comes from that only comes from knowing you, even though we walk through difficult times on this earth, Lord, may we have a, a certain confidence which cannot be shaken, knowing that our Lord and our Savior is, is near to us, even when we're feeling so alone. Lord, I pray for our communities around us. We have endured a troublous time this past year with the pandemic and everything related to it. Lord, I pray that we would not lose sight of our ultimate aim, which is to to see this earth come to an end, Heavenly Father, and to usher in your eternal kingdom. Help us, Lord, to be witnesses for you, both near and far. May we live lives which are ordered in such a way, dear Lord, which they would just draw other people to you. May people look on us, how we walk, how we talk, 
how we don't talk, and may they see something of Christ in our disposition. And may our lives, Lord, be a witness and a beacon of light in a cold and a dark world. We are nothing without you. And we're asking, Father, that you would live in us through your Holy Spirit, helping us to live the lives that would bring glory and honor to your name. We I pray for your church as we are, the community, the country is starting to open up as we start to make decisions about how we would do the same. May we be led by your spirit to make wise decisions, to make intelligent decisions. And above all, Lord, may we do things in, in such a way to bring glory and honor to your name. Father, as we are preparing to hear a word from you, I would like to lift up your manservant, our pastor. May you hide him behind the cross, Heavenly Father. We pray that you would place your words into his mouth. And as he speaks, we would, we would hear and we would perceive that the Lord is speaking directly to our hearts and to our needs. Lord, but when we have heard, may we not just be hearers, but help us, Lord, to be doers of the word also. May we tell other people about the things that we have learned here this Sabbath day, and may we live them in our lives. Help us not to be, to be hypocritical followers, Father, who speak one thing and do another. But may we find consistency in our walk with you. Lord, above all things, we are looking for the day when these things will be no more, where there will be no more disease, where there will be no more need for any vaccination, where there will be no more pain and suffering. Lord, we are looking for the day where we can go home to eternity with you, where all the trials and the toils of this life will have come to an end. Before that happens, Lord, we know we have a work to do. We know we have a, a, a world to win for Christ. And so, Lord, we humble ourselves before you, recognizing our insignificance, recognizing our weakness, but knowing that the God that we serve is above all. And that, Lord, whatever the things that are impossible for us to achieve, for you, Lord, it's just a small thing. Help us, Father. Help us to, to finish the work on this earth that the end may come. May this be our experience, dear Lord. And when that day should come, may we be looking for you in the clouds of glory, waiting for our Saviour to take us home. Lord, we look forward to this day. Keep us faithful until the end, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, children. I should say good afternoon, but let's start off with that. We have all experienced fear. And that's the title of our story today, How to Overcome Fear. Some are afraid of spiders. Others are afraid of sleeping in the dark. In Luke, the shepherds were afraid of the angels when they heard about the birth of Jesus. In Mark, Jesus' disciples were afraid when a powerful storm almost sunk their boat. This is their story. Jesus had been teaching and healing people all day long. It was evening now, and there were still many people who wanted to be near him. He had been working long hours every day, and he was exhausted. Across the lake, it was so peaceful. The towns along the shore were quiet and small. Jesus thought it would be a nice place to go and relax. He turned to the crowd of people. We have had a good day, but it is time to rest, he said. Turning to his disciples, Jesus asked, Are you ready, friends? They nodded and climbed into the boat. Jesus joined them. As they pushed off, they noticed other fishing boats on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus was so glad to be able to rest for a while. He lay down in the back of the boat. The restful sound of the waves may have helped Jesus go to sleep. Some of the disciples had been fishermen on this very lake. They loved to hear the night sounds and to feel the cool wind. But suddenly the wind changed direction, as it sometimes does on the Sea of Galilee. The disciples looked at the sky. Might be a storm, someone said. That could be, another agreed. 
they braced themselves as the wind howled down from the mountains. Storms often came up suddenly on the Sea of Galilee, and that is just what happened. Lightning flashed and thunder crashed. Huge waves soon began to splash into the boat. The disciples had to shout to hear one another. The disciples knew all about sailing and fishing. They knew all about boats and storms, but they didn't know what to do now. They were more than afraid. They were terrified. Then someone thought of Jesus. Jesus! Jesus! he shouted. The disciples had been trying so hard to do everything that good fishermen do in a storm that they had forgotten about Jesus. A flash of lightning cracked through the sky, and they all saw Jesus, still sleeping. Sleeping? Wake up, Jesus! Save us! We're about to drown! they yelled. Jesus stood up in the rocking boat. He saw the frightened faces of the disciples. They were wet and tired and helpless. Jesus lifted his hands. Quiet, he said. Be still. And right away, the storm just stopped. No more wind, no more lightning, no more waves crashing in. Why were you afraid? He asked the disciples. Where is your faith? The storm had pushed many of the boats close together, and now every person in every boat just stared at Jesus. He was not afraid, not even a little bit. Everybody began to whisper about Jesus. What kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Today and forever, Jesus is always with us. He knows what we need, and He will care for us wherever we go, whatever we do, if we will call on Him as the disciples did. That was their story. In John 14, verse 27, it says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. There are three points I will make here. One, Jesus always keeps his promises. The disciples had nothing to fear with Jesus in the boat. Two, Jesus is a prince. Not just any ordinary prince, like Prince Harry, for example. Oh, no. He is the prince of peace. He will always be watching over us and grant us his peace. We have only to trust him. The last point, you can overcome that fear. It may take hard work. It may take time. But you can count on Jesus to help you overcome. When we are afraid, we should go to God in prayer. Tell him all about it. We can ask him for his strength and courage. Just talking to him can increase your faith and make you stronger. Who can tell? Maybe you may just be another David in the making, or a Joshua, or a Gideon, or even an Esther. Let's not forget the girls. We need to talk about our fears, sharing them with others, focusing on the good things God has done for you and me. This will make your fear a minor annoyance or even completely disappear, making things look better and not as bad as they appear. We really do need to count our blessings one by one. We can always rely on God to help overcome our fears. When our trust in God becomes strong, your fears will become weak. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, give us the faith to have courage and to reside in you for all we can do 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank you very much for that lovely story. And our speaker this afternoon is Pastor Dan, none other than our own dear Pastor Dan. And it's a blessing that you have the time to spend with us this afternoon. We know that we have been blessed as you've spoken to us before, as you've brought the word of God. And we trust that the Lord will use you once more to speak to us today. And before we have Pastor Dan speaking to us, we have a meditation item. Okay. I see some nodding. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise yes. the Lord. After our meditational, um, the next voice you hear will be Pastor Dan. I I have the meditational for you, church. Uh, but before I do so, let me give you a little bit about it. Our meditational song comes to us from the Middle East University Church of Seventh Day Adventists. I'll call it the MEU. It's located in Beirut, Lebanon, a city that has been of central focus over the years for its troubles. Yet our church has maintained a presence there as far back as the 1940s. This sounds like a mission story. We at Bilston share a common link with the MEU, our worship of Christ in song. Many of our hymns are songs by the members of the MEU church, and I have been in contact with the church, and they send their greetings to the Bilston family. Just note how small our world has become through the means of modern communication. How great is our God. So, on to our meditational for today. Song by Eduardo and Evelyn Bovo of the MEU Church. My Redeemer is faithful and true. As I look back on this road I've traveled I see so many times he's carrying me through And if there's one thing that I've learned in this life Is my Redeemer is faithful and true My Redeemer is faithful and true Everything he has said he will do And every morning his mercies are new
Amen. Happy Sabbath Church. Happy glorious Sabbath day. It's been a week of uh, full sunshine. Despite uh, it's a bit cold, but I've been out and about um, church work and also for exercise and uh, with the family as well during this uh, wonderful um, school break. So uh, I believe that you get out, got out as well this week to get the process of the vitamin D in your body. Uh, wonderful. Now we just sang the song, uh, Faith, I mean, um, Hiding in Thee. Um, there are times when we have to sing appropriately, Hiding in Thee, under His wings. But also there are times when we have to go out, and come along the hills of lights and shout that faith is a victory. And so... This is the subject that I would like to bring to you today, and I would like you to kindly uh, bow your heads as we seek the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you will be with us and help us to understand once more uh, your will for us. And I pray that uh, we will be able to glean some important truth from a very known and well-known passage in scripture. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and thank you. Amen. I prepare a spiritual food for us today that deals with the subject of fear. What is fear? Where does it come from? What triggers us to fear? Why is fear so dangerous? How do we deal with fear? The very first mention of the word fear was from the reply given by Adam in Genesis chapter 3 after the Lord God initiated a conversation with them in their state of hiding. And so we read in Genesis 3, 9-10, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? And so he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. I was afraid. You see, after sin, after the glory has departed, after their innocence, after they have broken from their innocent trust in God, fear began. Where does it come from? It came after sin and fear replaced the carefree, worry-free, anxiety-free state of our first couple. Since then, everyone who is born in this world would have to experience fear because the perfect habitat for the human beings, along with all other creatures, is marred by the entrance of sin through disobedience. The world has become a dangerous place. There is just danger all around. We teach our children to be aware of danger. Innocent children are naturally carefree, but adults have to babysit them to protect them from dangers and potential harm they know nothing about. The more we know, the more we perceive the danger all around us. I wish I have stayed the stage of innocence. I wish I remained a baby. If I am a baby, I don't have to worry and be scared if I cannot pay my bills or pass my exam or bring food to the table or make mistakes or commit sin. I don't fear any virus because they are outside the realm of the world, outside my concern and even outside of my accountability. I wish I remained a baby, however, I so wish that the earth remained pure, the earth remained in its sinless state, and we did not fall into disobedience. But there is nothing I can do about it now. Here is the good news. God has been working to reverse the curse on this planet and bring back this earth into its former glory. The Word of God calls it the new heaven and the new earth. And that is going to happen, that is predestined to happen because Jesus has been victorious on the cross. His victory on Calvary guaranteed the end game in favor of God, in favor of His people, in favor to all those who trust 
in him. Meanwhile, we are not there yet. We are living between the then and the hereafter. We are in the middle of the two perfect stages. We are in the middle of the then perfect earth and the coming new heaven and new earth. We already have the assurance and the perfect guarantee, but we are not there yet. What we have now are God's providences. Therefore, in this stage of earth's history and timeline, he provides faith. He provides courage. He provides protection. He steps in when it is humanly impossible. He provides an environment for us to develop spiritual muscle and stamina to confront our fears so that despite what seems to appear as overwhelming odds in front and around us, we are empowered to confront them. And so today we have chosen a chapter, a story in the Bible that demonstrates this experience. First Samuel chapter 17. I know you know the story. And I have decided to bring to your attention once more the famous story of David and the giant. We may know the stories in the Bible, but because the Bible is a minefield of treasures that need digging, even the most common passage or narrative in Scripture can be studied again and again, and the gems of truth do not run out. Three out of eight of the sons of Jesse joined the army under Saul, but David remained at home. After a time, though, however, he went to visit the camp of Saul, and by his father's direction, he was to carry a message and a gift to his elder brothers and to learn if they were still in safety and in health. And this is when David met Goliath. The story of David and Goliath is more than a classic story of the underdog and the bully. It sounds almost untrue, except when we realize that this is God's battle. In 1 Samuel 17, 1-3, the Philistines were trying to penetrate the highlands of Judah through the valley of Elah. They were met there by Saul and his army. The Philistines and the Israelites arranged their forces on opposite sides of the valley. It's very risky for either army to begin to attack, because descending one slope, crossing the valley floor, wading its stream, and climbing up to the other side, the attackers will make themselves very vulnerable. And so the result is stalemate. Neither army dares to leave their position. Therefore, the Philistines resolve in challenging the Israelites with a one-to-one -one combat. And this encounter will then decide the battle. A victory for the giant will entitle the Philistines to dominate Israel once more. On the other hand, a victory for whoever answers Goliath's challenge will entitle Israel to dominate the Philistines. Now that one-to-one -one combat is introduced, the Israelites seem to have more problems than the Philistines. From verses 4 up to 7, the scripture introduces to us this giant, a literally overwhelming giant. His name is Goliath. He is the champion amongst the soldiers. Stood almost 10 feet tall, he had bronze helmet on his head, bronze scale armor, coat of 5,000 shekels or 125 pounds, bronze greaves on his legs, bronze javelin or spear slung on his back, the spear shaft, the iron point for his javelin alone weighs 600 shekels. It's 15 pounds or 7 kilograms. He is a walking arsenal. He is a killing machine. He doesn't need to pierce or stab you with his javelin. That 15-pound iron spear shaft alone is enough to make you unconscious the whole day with just a little swing of that thing on your head. He is here ready to introduce a massacre. Verse 11 reads, And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. What triggers fear is the threat of harm, either real or imagined. Now this is real. Verse 24 further takes note of the reaction on the part of the Israeli camp. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. The soldiers of Saul are trained and are enlisted to fight physically in the battlefield, and yet they are running away. Now, David is not trained to fight physically. We know he is going to fight later. But I want you to remember this, that before David had the victory in the physical battle, God gave him first 
the victory in the spiritual battle. He won the victory over fear. The stage of this battle is in the mind. The mind is the stage where all spiritual engagements and battles are fought first and foremost. And many of us like the action. We like to see the protagonist in action. We like to hear good results because of the action. We love to see the sequences of the action in the battlefield. But we often miss to look and to see and give due diligence to the importance of the starting point of the battlefield. It's the mind. It is normal or natural for the others to be afraid of Goliath. Look at his massive structure, his paraphernalia, his gear, his weapons. But perhaps that is just where our fear problem lies. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look at Jesus Christ, you'll be at rest. What Boom is alluding here is focus. The focus makes the difference. If we focus on our fears, we focus on the wrong thing. The focus is on Jesus because He alone can give us the calmness and the peace. You see, the battle is the Lord's. While everyone runs, David stands. While others were dismayed and horrified and shocked, David remained calm, cool, and steady. Why? It's about focus. The soldiers thought Goliath challenged them. David thought Goliath challenged God. Others thought it was their own battle. David declared the battle belongs to God. And the negative effect of fear is tremendous. It immobilizes the one who is overwhelmed with it. It restricts you and arrests you from doing something constructive. Verse 16, And the Philistine drew near morning and evening, and presented himself forty days. Now this verse is telling us of forty days of fear, forty days of indecision, forty days of maintaining the status quo. The problem why our burdens seem so heavy is because we own them too much and we carry them ourselves in our own strength for too long. Forty days of fear, forty days of indecision, forty days of maintaining the status quo. Cast all your cares, your worries, your anxieties, your fears upon him, for he cares for you. Uh, David, who has a different mindset and has tuned in and focused in the Lord, is not running, but is asking, in verse 26, What shall be done to the man that kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? His action is clear. He seeks to define, to name, and to confront the challenger. You know, everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous, for instance, knows that until you name your problem, you cannot begin to deal with it. So name your giant. Name your giant. You know, all throughout my life, until I finished college, I was so afraid of water deeper than my height. I did not know how to swim. It happened during my senior years when I was taking my BA degree. We were senior students before we graduate. We would go out for a swimming excursion and there were choices to make. I did not vote for swimming. I voted for something else. I did not know how to swim. I was overwhelmed with the fear of deep waters. I was so afraid of drowning. Unfortunately, the majority voted for swimming. And another thing that I worried so much about was for anyone to know that I did not know how to swim. I didn't want them to discover it. And so I traveled with them, with the rest of my classmates. My plan was to bring two good books and just read my books in a quiet corner. And so it happened. My plan worked very well. Everyone was jumping and diving into the fresh natural water in a deep pool. You could even drink the water. There was no chemical on it. The water source gushed out from the roots of the trees and rocks. It was a natural spring water. Everything went well. I was holding my book under a hut in a quiet corner. When all of a sudden, four naughty classmates of mine came to me with a purpose. 
one person grabbed my left arm the other person grabbed my right the other two bigger boys grabbed my legs and they carried me in front of everyone now everyone's eyes were fixed on me they were laughing and giggling and the next thing they did was not to put me on a special chair they hurried me into the pool into the deepest parts of that huge swimming pool and they threw me in there and they watched closely as to what I would do in the water it was as if my spirit has left me for a while I was in the deep water it was as if I was Jonah there I did not know what I did but I began to move in the water it wasn't the movement of someone swimming it was as if I was dancing they said to me that I was just like dancing a break dance in the water nobody helped me they were just laughing at me but for some reason I managed to inch toward the side of the pool and grabbed that concrete summoning all my strength including the rest of my adrenaline left in me and brought myself out of the water and run away from them two things I feared deep water second and for anyone to know that I did not know how to swim I really wanted to avoid deep water and, and I did not want anyone to know about it but on that memorable day that I would never forget for the rest of my life I was pushed and forced to face those fears you know after our graduation I determined to know for myself how to swim I went to the pool every day I practiced swimming I taught myself alone I decided to face my fears squarely why if others can I said to God then with determination and with your help Lord I also can and since then I learned how to swim under the water from one side of the pool to the other side I could hold my breath for long I would breath on the other side of the pool I learned how to do freestyle and the most favorite one that I like is the breaststroke my friends and I would go for about half a kilometer into the ocean with a boat and swim back to the shore using that stroke swimming used to trigger this incredible fear that I would feel on me now this fear is turned into one of my favorite hobbies what giant are you facing call it out by name David asks who is this that everyone feared who is this uncircumcised Philistine who defies the armies of the living God define name your giant confront it by knowing it and that is how David shrinks the giant down to size and the next thing David does is to cast aside those naysayers in verse 28 when Eliab David's oldest brother heard him speaking with the men he burned with anger at him and asked why have you come down here and with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is you came down only to watch the battle now his brother spoke to him as only older children can do to their younger siblings they can put you down and they can tell you you can't do this and you can't do that and Eliab just went ballistic he was angry he became aggressive to David but why you know Jesse was the father of eight sons remember the eldest is Eliab and the youngest was David Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel earlier as nominees and candidates for something mysterious and Samuel said unto Jesse the Lord has not chosen any of these sons of yours Eliab the eldest the manly the strong good-looking guy just couldn't not believe his eyes David his youngest brother has been chosen and anointed instead of him or the other older siblings perhaps deep down in his thoughts were the feelings of envy and indignation and it was just the right time that David was there during their 40 stressful days and David was criticized and was told off by his brother but he continued on 
You see, don't get distracted by the criticism of others when you face your personal battle. And be careful to avoid wasting energy, precious energy, fighting the wrong enemy. We may have difficult people in our families or in our church, but don't treat them like your enemy. We are on the same side here. Fight your personal battles. We don't fight each other. We fight together for the Lord. Verse 31. When the words were heard which David spoke, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. He was brought to the tent of the king, and I would like you to see another debilitating effect of fear here. And this is discouragement. Now that David is in the tent of Saul, in verse 32, David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. In verse 33, Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. You can't go and fight this Philistine. You're too young, and you're too inexperienced. And he has been at this fighting business since before. You haven't even started to shave yet. Your chest hasn't even filled out. You're no good. You see, first it was his brother. Now, it's the king himself. Do you see what kind of process David had to go through before he could even face the giant? You are not able to go. You can't fight. You are just a boy. And Saul and his army, you know, go from fear to discouragement. And when fear overwhelms a person, it continues to wear that person down until they are so discouraged. And they themselves would tend to discourage others. But when David was confronted with discouragement triggered by fear, he recalled how God manifested his providences in the past. Verses 34 to 36. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Now, what was David doing here? Was he bragging of his bravery? He killed lion, he killed bear, etc. single-handedly. Grabbing the mouth of a lion is a lot different from just shooing away the lion. Was he boasting? No. David did not do this to show off his own strength. In fact, there, was, there were likely no witnesses. He was recalling his thrilling experiences with God in the past, and he gave God the credit for his success in shepherding the sheep. And if God was with him in facing the bears and the lions, surely God will be with him in facing this giant. That was his argument. And Saul, in his discouraged mind, would not equate the works of a shepherd and the engagements of a warrior. Because shepherding is totally different from battle fighting. And many of us would say that David is too simplistic here. It's a childish reasoning. Well, perhaps in times of crisis, to be simplistic and to take the attitude of a child comes really very handy. You see, in Matthew 18, verse 3, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. When David was faced with discouragement, he recalled and he rehearsed his wonderful experiences with God in the past. He had the faith of a child. And David's conclusion in confronting discouragement brought about by fear is very simple. The Lord who rescued me from the paw, the lion, and the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. You see, his workplace provided him the environment to develop his spiritual muscle and confident faith. His daily work allowed him to fortify his faith in the Lord. 
You see, whatever line of work we have, whatever undertakings we are pursuing, there is always room whereby God will develop and prepare you for something in the future. You see, God is everywhere. Don't be so tunnel visioned. God is in your workplace. He can use you there to shine for Him. Yes, Samuel was in the temple. Yes, he was trained in the temple. But David's training was in the secular vocation. Yet regardless, spiritual battles and victories are to be won. And God is ready to provide those little victories wherever we are, preparing us for greater victories ahead of us, even in areas that we do not know anything about. The transition of David is remarkable. You see, from humble shepherd into the battlefield. And there is a huge gap. There is a remarkable chasm that divides in between. But the Lord has been filling in the gap. Fill your mind with God. David's mind was so filled with God that there was no more room for fear and discouragement to settle in. Of course, fear and discouragement will always be entertained by the mind, but they ought to be squeezed out with the presence of the Almighty God. But wait a minute. What if David was discouraged? The question is, who was supposed to fight against Goliath? That is the question. And the answer to that is found in 1 Samuel 9, verse 2. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a young man, and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. The giant amongst the Philistines is Goliath. We know that. But the giant amongst the Israelites at this point is who? It's King Saul. Not only was he tall, he was the most handsome. There was none finer than him. He literally stood head and shoulders above the crowd. He was the hunk. He was the hottest dude in his time. What we are saying here is Saul was the logical person to fight against the giant. He was the giant in Israel. He and not David was supposed to fight against Goliath. Earlier on, God said to Samuel, do not be deceived by outward forms and looks. Looks aren't everything. Men and women look at the face, but God looks straight into the heart. David's not a soldier. He's not a warrior. He's just a youth. You see, young people, there's always a place for you in the Lord's work. Expertise may help, but not as important as we have always thought. Because in the Lord's recruitment agency, no matter what, no matter who, no matter where you're from, no matter how small you think you are, God can do huge and extraordinary things for you once our humble talents are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And there is nothing that Saul could do now. Because Saul can sense that David speaks with words of faith bigger than his fears and discouragement. And so the Bible records him saying, Go and the Lord be with you. Verse 37. Now it could have been to his credit when he said, Go and the Lord be with you, period. But now in verse 38, he clad David with his clothing and he put a helmet of brass on his head and he clad him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword on his clothing, and he tried to go, for he had not proved it. And David said to Saul, I can't go with this, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. And David took them off. You see, this was from the Lord, that it might plainly appear that he fought and conquered in faith, and that the victory was from God, who works by the most feeble and most despised means and instruments. David was far better armed than any of Saul's army. Just as one who has learned the word of God and put them into practice is far better armed than one who is well versed in all professional arguments of unbelief. And David moved on in verse 40. He took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag which he had, 
even in his wallet, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Now here's the question. David chose five stones, but why five stones? One stone is enough to kill a giant. Is this not an indication of a lack of faith? Now let me suggest, David chose five stones, not because he lacked faith, but because he did not possess a presumptuous faith. He picked five stones because he had no way of knowing if he would be able to kill Goliath in his first try. It would have been wrong for David not to have grabbed more than one stone. You see, it's easy for us to say four stones too many. To be honest, if I were to face a giant, I will bring 20 stones. You're not going to battlefield with just one bullet, are you? David chose five stones in case he will miss. Perchance the shield bearer will come to the rescue. At least he has some contingency plan, and that is not unbelief. Now, you can drive from here to Scotland without eating your breakfast, but you cannot drive from here to Scotland with just a litter of fuel in your tank. Faith does not set aside reason. Just because we have faith in God doesn't mean that we have to give up common sense. Just because you prayed for traveling mercies doesn't mean your seatbelt is no longer necessary. Verse 41 to 44. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy glowing with health and hands, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. And David's reply is profound in verse 45. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. When God is introduced in our battles, there is victory. When God is introduced in our problems, there is solution. When God is introduced into our sorrows, there is comfort. What a mighty God we serve. Then, with confidence, David pronounced the death sentence of Goliath. In verse 47, all those who gathered here, David says, will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give all of you into our hands. While David and Goliath are now standing on the valley of Elah, there are two different perspectives. Now all eyes are focused on Goliath and how tiny David is in comparison. Goliath is the epitome of someone or something who strikes fear and discouragement on anyone. And there are two different perspectives. First, the Israeli soldiers looking intently. They were trembling and saying, My, oh my. Look at Goliath, the champion is enormous. He is massive and he is the best of the best. Surely he cannot be defeated. Now the second perspective is that of David. Looking intently at the same giant, he says, Wow, now this is the biggest forehead I've ever seen. Surely I will never miss my target. Two people can look at the same thing and see it differently. Your standing before God determines how you see things in front of you. You see, positive thinking cannot produce faith, but genuine faith produces composure, produces calmness, and produces positive outlook even amidst difficult and impossible circumstances around. Only a boy named David, only a little slang. Only a boy, but he could pray and he could sing. And David's five stones represent his focus on the solution, not on the problem. He faces and names the giant. He casts aside the naysayers. He recalls God's goodness and providences in the past. And he puts his trust not on human strength, but on God. Are you focusing on the problem or on the solution? Focus on Jesus. Are you running away from what triggers your fear? 
Face it, define it, name it, share it in prayer. Are you listening to negative whispers and thoughts? Open your ears to His promises. Do not forget, you are not here if God was not faithful to you in the past. And so recall, remember His goodness in the past and put your trust only in Him. And watch how the Lord shrinks all your fears down to size. He can give you calmness. He can give you tranquility and peace. The Lord bless you. Amen. 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 Didn't our heart burn within us as we listened? I pray that each and every one of us will take and gain something from this message of hope and how we can be victorious. I love all the examples Pastor gave. And so, you know, we've got nothing to fear for the future, Sister White tells us, except as we forget the way the Lord has led us in the past. But therefore, brethren, you know, let us continue to hold on to God. And uh, we too can be like David. At this time, we'll close our service with the use of him 608. Faith is the victory. 608. Father, thank you for Jesus who had overcome the world. And when we are in him, we will be victorious. We pray, O Lord, that you will give us that victory in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we will cast out all our fears. And in the name of Jesus, 
our hearts and our minds will be filled with him. Thank you that you hear this prayer. And this will be true in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 We can pass the one more time for that message that is given to us, that it will help us as we walk our Christian journey. And, uh, you know, we continue to pray for you as well, Pastor, and your family, and that your ministry will continue to be, you know, success. Thank you.